Good morning, and uh, welcome to the 11th Annual Executive Branch Review Conference. My name is Nate Kazmarek, and I am Vice President and Director of the Practice Groups for the Federal Society. We are delighted uh, that you could be here with us at the Mayflower. We'd also like to greet those of you who are watching us remotely via the live stream. The other day I was watching the first opening session of the first Executive Branch Review Conference more than 10 years ago. That panel was titled, Is the Administrative State on the Rise? In his initial remarks, Dean Reuter was encouraging the audience to find a handout with a true novelty, a QR code from the Federal Society. We waited for, he waited for everyone to locate it in their seats and then directed them on the card uh, to take, take the card home to their children so that they could show them how to read the card uh, QR code with their cell phone. In the decade that has passed, some, uh, some things have changed. We now charge to attend this event. We now live stream every panel. We are familiar with and use QR codes all the time, including to help us with important tasks like signing in and signing out for CLE at our conferences. There's a QR code on the back of your program to do so. But other things remain the same. Our senior vice president and general counsel, Dean Reuter, who provided excellent leadership for this conference since its inception, is still here today. And we look forward to his fireside chat with former Vice President Pence this afternoon. Our 15 practice group executive committees remain devoted to hosting excellent panel discussions and asking important questions about the executive. This year, particularly focused on transparency and accountability. And brave souls like Clinton Administration Administrator of OIRA and NYU law professor Sally Katzen are still willing, to, still willing to come here to engage with us candidly in order to enrich our discourse. Thank you for joining us once again, Sally. <laughs> Thanks as well to my great uh, Federal Society colleagues who worked very hard to put together today's conference. So let's get things started by turning to our opening plenary session, which is co-sponsored with our Regulatory Transparency Project. This session is titled Regulatory Review Reset. We certainly have an all-star panel and are very pleased that Andrew Ullman is here to moderate our discussion. Andrew is a partner with Mayor Brown, where his practice focuses on complex financial services, regulatory, and public policy matters. He previously served as Deputy Assistant to the President for Economic Policy and Deputy Director of the National Economic Council. Prior to that, he served as Chief Counsel at the U.S. Senate Banking Committee, I'm sorry, U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. For full bios of our speakers today, you can visit our website, fedsoc.org. One last note before I hand it over to Andrew. At the very end of this panel, uh, we will be showing two quick upcoming Federal Society film trailers. So please stay in your seats at the end of this session and we will show those trailers. With that, thanks all very much for being here. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction. Well, it's my pleasure uh, to moderate this panel on the Biden administration's recent proposals to reform the regulatory review process of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, also known as OIRA, at the Office of Management and Budget. This is an apt starting place for today's conference on important developments in the uh, executive branch. This is because OIRA, while is, uh, is not well known outside of Washington and is little understood within, yeah, OIRA plays a central and pivotal role in the development of federal, federal regulation. If one wants to understand federal regulation, one has to understand OIRA. And this, uh, the timing of our pa panel could, uh, couldn't be better. Earlier this month, President Biden issued an executive order on modernizing the regulatory review process. And concurrently, the uh, OIRA issued several supporting uh, reform proposals, which collectively, these proposals would substantially re uh, uh, revise and modernize the way that OIRA conducts regulatory reviews and when it does, and how agencies develop uh, regulations, including how they use cost-benefit analysis. So to discuss these proposals and their potential impacts on public policy, we are very fortunate today 
to have with us several of the nation's leading experts on OIRA and federal regulation. So uh, let me get, begin by introducing our panel. Starting at my far right, Susan Dudley is the director of the George Washington Center, uh, George Washington University Regulatory Studies Center, and a distinguished professor of practice in the, at, uh, at the, in the Tranchenberg School of Public Policy and Administration. She served as the uh, OIRA administrator in the Bush administration from 2007 to 2008. She had previously served as an economist at OIRA for five years, so, so, so she has lots of time in the building, as we would say. Um, previously, Susan had also directed the Regulatory Studies Program at the Mercatus Center and taught uh, courses on regulation at, George, at the George Mason University School of Law. And she also previously served as a staff economist at the EPA and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. She is also um, president, uh, has the past president of the Society for Cost-Benefit Analysis, which is highly relevant for our discussion today. She's a graduate of the Sloan School of Management at MIT and the University of Massachusetts. She is also uh, an author. She literally wrote the book on regulation called Regulation, a primer. Um, our next panelist is Sally Katzen, who is, the, who, is a, who is Professor of Practice and Distinguished Scholar in Residence at the New York University School of Law. She is also the co-director of the Legislative and Regulatory uh, Process Clinic. Uh, Sally served in the Clinton administration as the administrator of OIRA from 1993 to 1998, also uh, having some significant time uh, in, in the building. Also very importantly, she served as the Deputy Assistant to the President for Economic Policy and the Deputy Director of the NEC, uh, which maybe we should have another uh, conversation about. Uh, as much as being the head of OIRA must have been great, I assume uh, NEC Deputy was e uh, equally, if not uh, a better job. Um, she was also Deputy Director of, uh, uh, at, the, uh, at OMB. Before joining the Clinton administration, Sally was a partner at, at the law firm of Wilmer Cutler and Pick, uh, Pickering. And earlier in her career, she served in the Carter administration as the general counsel of the Council on Wage and Price Stability in the executive office of the president. Given what's going on in inflation, maybe we have to come back to that experience later, uh, later in our discussion. Uh, she's a graduate of Smith College and the University of Michigan Law School. She clerked for Judge um, uh, Jay Skelly Wright on the US DC circuit. Uh, our final panelist is Anthony Campo. Uh, Anthony is a principal at Clark Hill where he focuses on complex regulatory privacy, data and compliance and corporate governance issues. Anthony served as, uh, previously served as the chief of staff and counselor at OIRA from 2017 and 2019. In that ro role, I can uh, personally attest, uh, Anthony was the person who made the office run and function, which I think we'll hear more about. Uh, Anthony also was previously an in-house counsel and assistant secretary of the board for a large university and also served as a regulatory fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He previously clerked for the Honorable Naomi Rao on the DC circuit. Uh, he is also a graduate of the University, uh, Georgetown University Law Center and Southeastern University. So with those introductions behind us, um, I think we want to start out with just a little uh, one -on -one, 101 uh, on OIRA for those of you who are not familiar uh, to build a base of a common knowledge. So Susan, why don't I start with you. Just walk us through, what is OIRA? What's this weird acronym we have here? And uh, what does it do? And what's its function in the federal government? Uh, thanks, Andrew. How many people in the room have heard of OIRA? Excellent. I've never seen so many hands raised for that question. Um, so maybe you don't need this introduction, but it's um, OIRA is a small agency in, um, within the Office of Management and Budget in the Executive Office of the President. It was technically created by the Paperwork Reduction Act, which Jimmy Carter signed in 1980. All right, people behind the ear, I'm going to have to talk into the mic, so I'm not looking yeah. at you. Why don't you move over? Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> oh. You guys move over. Uh, we won't call on anybody. <laughs> well, I might. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but it was when, when Reagan was elected in 1981, he gave this new office responsibility for re reviewing all the regulations of the executive branch. Um, so um, under executive order 12291, Sally and I were comparing notes at how many of these old executive orders we can just rattle off. 
Um, <clears throat> when President Clinton was elected, there were a lot of people who hoped that he would ab abandon this office and this um, interagency review process, but with Sally at the helm of OIRA, he did not. Um, instead, he issued Executive Order 12866, which is still in effect today. So think about that. An executive order that can be rescinded with the stroke of a pen has survived for almost 30 years. We'll celebrate its 30th birthday in, um, in August. Um, so it's a, um, OIRA is a small staff, and um, Andrew pronounced OIRA right. That's important to know how to, how to pronounce it. Um, and also the staff of about 50 are OIRanians. And <laughs> Sally and I are still OIRanians. You, you never lose that. Headed by a, um, a PAS administrator. So quickly what it does is it wears, the OIRA staff wear four hats. One is what President Obama called a dispassionate and analytical second opinion on agencies' actions. So that's the looking at the regulatory impact analysis, um, focusing on economic efficiency, but also bringing in scientific, legal, um, engineering, other arguments. Um, statistics, the chief uh, statistician of the United States is a branch chief in OIRA. Um, the second hat is interagency coordination. So often a wider review of a regulation and sharing it with other relevant agencies may be the only time that, um, it may be the first time that agencies have seen um, things that are relevant to them that others are doing. I know Cass Sunstein emphasized that um, after he left as a wire administrator. The third is that they ensure that the president's um, policies are, are respected and reflected in the regulations. And that's an important component that I'm sure our former NEC um, leads will, will agree with, that um, OIRA is a career staff within the EOP, which is largely non-career, largely politicals, and they bring that institutional knowledge to it. And, um, and so it helps the president understand what agencies are doing and, and um, and are relevant. Um, I mean, I think about Elena Kagan's article, Presidential Administration, and the importance of a important role that OIRA plays in that. And then finally, we might touch on this today, is meeting with the public. So when a regulation is under review, OIRA will um, accept requests for meetings with the public. So with that, Andrew, Maybe too long-winded explanation no, given that, the number of hands. That was, that was perfect. So why don't, I, why don't I turn it over to Anthony then to give us a little bit more detail about how, how that mission of OIRA is actually uh, undertaken. You know, as chief of staff, you're the point person on, on, um, on making sure the, um, the organization works. So walk us through exactly what does that mean on a day-to-day -day basis? Great, thank you uh, very much, Andrew. Um, so one of the things that we really tried to emphasize, um, I guess as a sort of preliminary step, um, was the unified agenda. We really tried to breathe life uh, back into that uh, document and process. Um, so the agenda is this mechanism, mechanism by which uh, the executive branch tells the public everything that it's working on, everything that's in the pipeline. So um, a kind of preliminary thing we did was to try to get everybody aligned across the EOP and across the executive branch on what exactly is the president's agenda. And let's make sure that we are reflecting that in this public document, um, not just at a high level of policy, but at a very granular level of implementation. What are the exact regulatory instruments that are going to be used to implement and achieve that agenda um, and have them in that document? Um, and then, um, uh, the process starts generally at each review. So OIRA, you know, reviews rules, as Susan said, and that starts with a significance determination process. A desk officer, uh, in, its, in the course of a regular conversation with agency counterpart, uh, says this rule we think is economically significant or policy significant, legally significant, something else, brings it in for review and circulates it around the executive office of the president and to uh, interagency stakeholders that have uh, an equity in that um, process. So. Perhaps it's an EPA rule and they want to make sure that the Interior Department or uh, FERC or some other uh, sort of sibling agency uh, has an opportunity to see it, uh, contemplate it, think about the interaction of the various uh, um, le legal and regulatory jurisdictions, make sure it all sort of works together rationally. 
Um, and so runs that process and that, uh, that can be uh, as simple as an email exchange um, on the policy or it can lead to 20 rounds of policy conversations uh, around big tables with lots of people talking to each other nicely or not so nicely, uh, dis discussing, debating uh, the substance of the policy, discussing the analysis, discussing the legal rationale, um, and really benefiting from the various um, strengths of the executive branch. So perhaps you have Justice Department lawyers there who've you know, litigated uh, the, the basically the same, you know, five different permutations of this policy in the past and can tell you, you know, what, what the status uh, uh, is of it in the courts and that sort of thing. Um, bring all those various perspectives uh, to bear. Um, and th those can sort of escalate all the way up, um, you know, to the top uh, as necessary. Um, so um, that's a sort of the review process, um, but there are also, you know, uh, Andrew and uh, Sally and lots of others uh, sort of ran, you know, policy processes within the EOP and within the executive branch and uh, OIRA staff. Often we had OIRA staff attend a lot of those um, to be a part uh, of the conversation before uh, even Penn maybe gets to paper on the drafting process to say, no, no, you know, you're thinking about this completely wrong. There's a, there's a different area where you should be you know, uh, a different regulatory docket that maybe addresses this um, more rationally, something like that. Um, so participating in kind of the ordinary policy development processes and then on the back end once the policies are developed to make sure everything works consistent with the architecture that we're gonna talk about a little bit more. Sure. Yeah, and I'll just say as, as somebody who uh, engaged a fair amount with OIRA during my time in the White House, I always found the staff incredibly professional and very constructive and helped give the White House uh, a more orderly process for following all of the regulations that the entire federal government does. I think that's one thing that uh, when you get to the White House, you realize that how many different agencies and departments are issuing regulations, and OIRA really does provide a way to organize and to uh, come up with a process to make sure that each are pro appropriately considered. Now, with that background, uh, let's jump into now uh, what the Biden administration has proposed. And I I'm gonna ask you, Sally, if can you just give us some background, I think that's essential for understanding what uh, these reform proposals involve by talking about first uh, Executive Order uh, 128866, uh, which um, uh, is the kind of building block uh, executive order that uh, Susan mentioned and how the, the Biden administration's uh, proposals would uh, modify uh, its requirements. <clears throat> Thank you, and I'm delighted to be here um, I'm always surprised when the Federalist Society wants to invite me. I wear a D jersey uh, and have served in Democratic administrations and often perform the function of the skunk at the picnic at these uh, uh, discussions. Today, I think we're all like-minded in respect of OIRA and uh, trust in its, its principles. So I don't think there'll be quite as much um, differences of opinion, but we have them uh, and, and I'm sure we will share them. Um, Susan mentioned um, the Reagan executive order, uh, 12911, and that was uh, the first time that uh, it was established that there would be a review, centralized review by an office close to the president, and second, that there would be decisional criteria, that there would be an economic analysis, and it was uh, incumbent upon the agency to say that the uh, benefits uh, were greater than the costs of any proposals that were to go forward. And that was the essence of the Reagan and then Reagan-Bush order uh, that was there for 12 years. It was wildly hated by the Democrats on the Hill uh, for a number of reasons, including one, they had delegated authority in their infinite wisdom to the agencies and what was the White House doing screwing around uh, in the merits of this. Uh, two, it was m meant to be deregulatory, and there was an emphasis on costs rather than benefits, 
And this was seen to be deleterious to the objectives of many of those in Congress. And three, it was a big black box. No one knew what was happening, who was meeting with whom, how long it would take, what was going on. It was uh, the world's greatest held secret. And so, as Susan said, it was assumed that when President Clinton was elected, he would disband OIRA and that would be, uh, rescind the executive order and that would be the end of it, but it was not to be. We revised the executive order and we gave birth to 12866. The numbers just trip lovingly off my tongue. <laughs> <clears throat> um, it did a number of things. It was more selective. Uh, the Reagan order had called for all regulations to be reviewed. The Clinton order called only for those that were significant, a term used by Anthony, a term used by Susan. And it was designed to be more transparent. There were rules made about who would be meeting with whom and uh, who would be uh, in, in attendance. It was more flexible. I used to say that uh, the cost-benefit analysis was informative, but not definitive, and that we were interested in non-monetized, even non-quantifiable uh, benefits that are difficult to uh, quantify or monetize. Um, uh, there was um, time limits imposed and other such things. And that was signed by President Clinton on September 30th, 1993. Every administration since has touched the document in different ways. George W. Bush, in the middle of his second term, but right before Susan arrived, uh, put out a series of amendments which um, President Obama uh, um, disapproved of and removed on day one. Uh, President Obama added a series of provisions whereby he uh, reaffirmed 12866, but focused extensively on retro uh, perspective views of um, regulations so that uh, uh, agencies would try to figure out what they did right, what they did wrong, and perhaps get rid of a lot of them. Uh, President Trump, uh, who did not um, uh, write off the books either the Obama or the Clinton executive order, may or may not have followed them precisely. He used a different approach with his two-for-one regulatory budget and other executive orders in which his approach was clearly deregulatory. Let's get rid of, there's this picture of him with stacks of paper and red tape, and he was holding a giant scissors. Uh, golden scissors? Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> golden scissors <laughs> to cut the red tape. Um, which, uh, and his executive orders um, were uh, disapproved and uh, eliminated on day one by Biden. So everybody has done uh, a little bit, some of which has been uh, maintained, others of which has not. This one by, by President Biden puts most of its emphasis on bringing in marginalized communities, something that he had uh, spoken about during uh, the campaign and was a day one uh, memorandum uh, to modernize um, uh, the uh, regulatory process. He was worried about underserved communities who had not participated uh, in the regulatory process. Now, the actual executive order that he released last week or 10 days ago, time flies when you're having fun, my last class and now I have to grade exams, oh my god. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, there is some updating. For example, he changes the $100 million threshold for an economically significant regulation to 200 million, which exactly tracks 
inflation, so not new. He also suggests, or actually provides, uh, and this was Susan's pickup, I want to give her full credit for this, that every three years this number would be increased by the inflation. And I think Susan is absolutely correct when she says that makes it seem so precise uh, in a way that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, review is for things that are important, that are for things that are big, and, and nothing hovers right at the line. I know that when we wrote 12866, we kept the 100 million that Reagan had used because we looked at the inventory of what was before us, and they were is it either a couple million dollars or almost a billion dollars? I mean, nothing was hovering at the 100 million that if you changed it by 2% is gonna, is gonna uh, in, uh, bring in lots more. So I'm, I'm not sure what all that does for us on, on this one. Um, he also changed the process for the fourth category. There's three categories of significant which remain essentially unchanged except for the update, economically significant budgetary impacts and inconsistency with other agency actions. He also changed the description of the fourth, which was novelty, uh, as we had written in a novel. And that's kind of um, interesting. We had thought of it as a stopgap. What was novel? What was novel was, well, that was the question I got all the time. How are you defining novel? And I, I searched for a definition, and what I came up with was, I don't know, but, but your communications director will know. <laughs> Walk down the hall and talk to your communications director. When we release this, is it going on the front page of the Washington Post or the New York Times? Or is it going on the last page of Inside EPA? If it's the latter, we don't want to see it. If it's the former, we do want to see it. And, and that was the description of novelty which I lived with and which I thought actually was pretty crisp, uh, but turned out uh, to be more difficult to manage. And while it was a, a real backstop for us, and we only picked up a few, it has turned out over the years to be an increasingly large percentage of what has been brought in as significant. And I think the agencies are saying, whoa, this is undefined. Who's doing this? What's happening? And so you have that. But what I really love, if I can take a few more yep. minutes, what I really am particularly intrigued by is the, the bulk of this executive order um, is an attempt to deal with these meetings that are held by OIRA with people outside the administration. Now, when we started, these meetings were relatively infrequent. Uh, on the big ticket items, we'd get a lot of requests. At that time, I went to every single meeting. As a result, a very senior person at the agency went to every single meeting so that they were hearing what I was hearing. And I didn't like to hear about law, even though I'm a lawyer by training. I told them I want to talk about the policies involved here and the mechanics. Or I would say, humor me, there is a problem. Just accept that, what would you do? And I learned a lot. And I, I got a lot of information from these, as did the agency representative. And when we had a lot of requests, I put them together. All the oil companies are gonna come in at one time. Or all the public interest groups are gonna come in at one time. And we're gonna listen to you all. And so there, A, weren't that many meetings, B, I attended them all, and see, they were productive. Flash forward, fast forward, I guess you say, fast, fast forward uh, 30 years, and now I have been told it is legal malpractice if you do not request a meeting, whether you have anything to say or not. You gotta request a meeting, you gotta go in there, you gotta plead your case. Two, 
they do talk a lot about the law and they talk about everything else in between. And because these meetings are held without any disclosure by the Iranian staff as to what the document says, there's a weird thing going on where people are speculating all over the place about what's really happening and the OIRA staff is sitting there, see no evil, hear no evil, talk no evil, whatever the, the thing is, but they, they're stone silent. This is a colossal waste of time. It is a colossal waste of resources by a very small staff. And I have been pleading for the last 20 years to get a grip on this process and tighten it. So here we see some tightening, but also some loosening. On the one hand, and this is the tightening part, the executive order says that OIRA shall come up with a scheme in which to discourage the frequent visitors who take advantage of every opportunity to ever argue every single thing. And that's for OIRA to try to figure out. I think they should be even more aggressive on that front. They say twice in the document that they're gonna take all meetings. Why? That's absurd. Okay. The second piece is that the executive order calls for enticing, welcoming, accepting marginalized communities to participate. Now this has raised some issues in the administrative law world. The thought of comments, notice comment, the thought of comments is to do analysis, is to either critique the agency's analysis or provide your own analysis. It's substantive. It's to educate the agency or it's to uh, shed new light or provide new ideas. These, quote, marginalized communities do not have the resources, resources, easy for me to say, do not have the resources to develop these kinds of inputs. And we know that rulemaking is not a plebiscite. So it's not appropriate for them to come to the table and say, I vote against this. On the other hand, I fervently believe that they have something to contribute. They can say, as no one else can, you're doing this to help me. I'm the regulatory beneficiary, right? This ain't gonna do it. This doesn't meet what I need, or this is off kilt from where I am. That's important to hear, because so many times we assume, A, full compliance, and B, accomplishment of the objectives. That may not matter. Or you may not get the full compliance. And to hear people say, not gonna work in my community, or that's not my experience, that's not my problem. Hmm. Here's where I'm coming from, I think is incredibly important. And so that piece of this executive order, I think is, is, is tremendously important. It's consistent with President Biden's attempt to take a government-wide look at embracing all of our citizens and bringing everyone to the table, and I'm sorry I took so much time. <laughs> that, that's, that's perfect. So I want to move to Susan now to follow up on the other aspect of the um, Biden EO, which is the updating of Circular A4. Oh, yes. So I'll, I'll let me have Su Susan address that. Um, now this, this uh, sounds incredibly bureaucratic and technical, the old circular A4, what's going on here? Um, but Susan, I, but I, I think care. this is a really important, uh, uh, an equally important part of what the EO is doing. So you can walk us through what is circular A4, uh, what does it do now, and what are the proposed changes uh, to it? Yeah, and I know that you meant to talk about that, because there were three changes yeah. to, the executive order did three main just things. got caught up. Yes. <laughs> um, and let me just add one more thing on the definition of significance, which means which rules come into OIRA. Um, on that fourth category, that the novel category, not only was the definition changed, but the OIRA administrator needs to personally approve those before they are, are brought into review. Um, so, Circular A4, um, yes, Andrew's right, it, it may sound like you 
but you should be interested in this. So A4 is regulatory impact analysis guidelines that were published after going through notice and comment and getting peer review in 2003. Um, they had been built on economic analysis guidelines that had came out in, um, in Sally's, uh, during Sally's time. Um, so it's, you know, given the amount, so we've got another 20 years, it, it may well be time to see what needs to be modernized and what needs to be updated. Um, I haven't digested it yet. Um, it's 91 pages compared to the 48 pages in the existing Circular A4, plus a 34-page preamble. And if you're interested in this, I strongly encourage you to read the preamble as well as the draft guidelines. The guidelines are open for public comment until June 6th. So, um, if, it, and it is something that I think they're very open to, and that preamble tells you what topics especially they're interested in. So I would say just um, an overarching change is there's less, it seems less focused on efficiency um, than, um, than the previous order and does bring in things like what Sally mentioned, how con more consideration of distributional impacts. Um, I keep looking down, but I don't have any notes, so. Um, so um, to that point, for example, there is a discussion of distributional impacts. And previous orders also had that. Um, President you know, 12866 talks about understanding who's bearing the cost, who's receiving the benefits. Reagan's order did. I think Carter's order before that also talked about that. As part of the analysis, he required agencies to perform. Um, but we really aren't doing it very well. We still do these analyses and get an, on average, this, these are the benefits and these are the costs. Um, so that's an important aspect of the new, or, new order. What concerns me about it is that instead of laying out clearly who's receiving benefits and who's receiving costs or how they differ across different um, communities of interest, um, there's a discussion of putting weights on benefits. And I think once you do that, you really do get the black box that Sally was talking about. So the decisions, the policy decisions, get made in the analysis rather than by the policy officials when the analysis is laid out before them. And I think that's the real value of regulatory impact analysis, is to lay out for policy officials what we expect to be the likely advantages, disadvantages, um, benefits and costs, um, and then allow, so that with that information, the policy official makes a decision. As Sally said, and she always says, and I love this phrase, RIA is meant to be informative, not dispositive. Um, so trying to put some of the policy judgments into the analysis itself, the resulting analysis, I think, will be less valuable. Um, we, we also seem, see some of that more normative, um, prescriptive rather than descriptive in, um, I think, in the discount rates. And this might be the most significant change. Um, the circular A4, uh, the 2003, the existing circular, um, asked agencies to analyze their benefits and costs using both a 3% and a 7% rate. Um, and the current one says 1.7% um, for, for everything. What that does um, is that it makes um, the, the value of future benefits relative to um, upfront costs of achieving those benefits much higher. So for example, appliance efficiency standards. Um, if the, the value of the um, energy savings that consumers get from buying a more efficient clothes washer um, is discounted at 1.7%, it's going to look as if it's saving consumers a lot of money. Um, and low-income consumers who may not be able to borrow at 1.7%, they are really not saving that money, and yet that's the kind of thing. I, so I think the discount rate is a very important, um, the uh, weights for, for distribution as opposed to clearly laying out the distributional impacts. Um, the, in talking about the scope, the previous order, A4 says your scope is domestic benefits and costs. 
If you think that the global benefits or costs are particularly important, do that as a separate analysis. This doesn't really stray, well, it does stray from that, but it still talks about the importance of understanding the benefits and costs domestically. Um, but it does open a much wider door for making decisions based on global, global impact. And that's something that I think since there are a lot of lawyers in the room, that's a question to be able to think through in terms of statutes. If the statutory authority addresses impacts on citizens of the United States, and if the using domestic benefits, it doesn't pass a cost-benefit test. It costs US citizens as consumers or workers um, a lot more than the benefits that they get. Is that st consistent with their statute? So I'll, I'll just um, lay my um, non-lawyer analysis out there like that. I'm sure there are other aspects of it that I'm forgetting, and I'm just going to stop because we'll probably come up with it during our discussion. So, so why don't I turn to Anthony, who is a lawyer, <laughs> and we'll get the legal analysis. Also, Anthony, can you, you take, uh, building on what Susan uh, said about um, what uh, A4, uh, the reforms that A4 would do, what are the kind of policy implications and how is it going to change and how federal uh, regulations are developed? Right. So um, I guess there, there are going to be a lot of uh, changes in the near and medium term that flow from this in the, act, in the sort of day-to-day policymaking process. But I guess where I'd like to start is in the longer, over the longer term, um, I think I am pretty concerned that this is going to, um, you know, look, we, we took a pass on these kind of changes. We very much wanted to reform A4 in a different direction, and we took a pass on that. Um, we talked about it, we debated it, we went over it um, for years. Um, and same with 12866, and Sally mentioned some of the changes that we made, but you will note that our changes were all supplemental to 12866 and A4. They did not open in any way. We changed not one word or comma or anything about 12866 or A4. All of the requirements were still in place. We enforce them. Sally may not think we did a good enough job of enforcing them, but there is a 12866 discussion in all of our rules. And we went through the analysis carefully. Um, uh, uh, Cost-benefit analysis was integral to um, the regulatory budget. Uh, the regulatory budget was built on top of the A4 and 12866 framework. Um, we did not throw anything away. Um, and so I think I personally, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm a little more frustrated than my, my co-panelists here, I think, um, in, in seeing this because um, we took a lot of criticism for our regulatory budget. They said, you're, you're you know, dismantling the foundation of the administrative state. We did something separate. We layered on top of everything that was already there a new framework for thinking about how to make po regulatory policy choices. Um, and we did not discard anything underneath. Um, despite the fact that this was the sort of running discussion that we were throwing it all away, throwing it all in the garbage can, we did not do that. Today, we have a rewrite of the foundational documents of the administrative state. They're opening, 12866 is open, it's on the table. You can go comment on it now. These changes are to the text of 12866 that Sally, as she mentioned, labored so intensely for so many years. Here I am protecting Sally's baby. Uh, she, she, she worked very hard for 12866, um, and uh, I have a lot of problems with it. My fellow travelers, we, we, there are all kinds of things we wanted to do to that document, and we didn't do it. Um, and I, uh, so again, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I think, a little, a little frustrated. And I think what's going to happen is, um, <clears throat> If the administration proceeds with these, okay, Susan put it very kindly, as she always does. She said that it sort of um, seems less focused on efficiency. The phrase economic efficiency appears nowhere in the text of A4, the proposed A4, nowhere. It appears one time in a footnote in reference to distributional effects and why we need to have more distributional effect analysis and provide an extra weighting for distributional analysis. I'm perfectly fine with distribution, analyzing distributional effects, as I have said for many years. I think it's an important part. It may not be the part that we emphasize as much, but it's been there for a long time. We respect that long-standing bipartisan consensus and, uh, and agreed to let it remain and be part of the regular sort of flow of, of analysis. 
Um, but that's the only context in which economic efficiency is mentioned at all in the new A4. I think that's disastrous. It's a move away from economic efficiency intentionally, directionally, uh, and it's significant. Um, and I think that this, um, this proposal will commence a, a process where every four years or eight years we rewrite the foundational documents of the administrative state. And if you are a sort of small c conservative who thinks that, you know, one of the objectives of, you know, competent administration is stability over decades uh, and being able to have, you know, not a lot of disruption, I think you should be very concerned about these uh, changes. Um, <clears throat> not to put it too, uh, put too fine a point on it. But um, uh, I, I think that there will be from, you know, sort of for the foreseeable future, um, a, a, a sort of full revisiting and rewriting of these documents. And I, I think that, um, again, we took a pass on that uh, last time around. I don't think that's going to happen next time. And, I, um, and uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how it sort of all unfolds. So we can get into the specifics of it so more. So let, let me just do a follow-up with you on this, because I think this is a, a really a, uh, key issue uh, to discuss on this, which is you make a very good point about the importance of stability and predictability in the regulatory process, particularly across administrations, and we've certainly had that here. Um, and the idea, though, right, is to make sure that the president has uh, a reliable process to make sure that agencies are, are, um, are fully informed before they, they make decisions, and most importantly, that presidential uh, policies are reflected in uh, uh, regulations. Why couldn't just is the why can't one simply look at what's happening here? Is President Biden determining that he wants to make uh, a policy change on how regulations are promulgated throughout the federal government? Uh -huh. So in a way, what's happening here is that this is just another pre stamp of presidential priorities. Is that his priorities on how cost benefit analysis is conducted, how the regulatory review process is conducted, uh, is simply different. And here we're actually seeing presidential, this is not a case of where um, uh, agencies are off doing something contrary to what uh, the president would want, want to do. This is a, a case of where uh, the proposals uh, are, are in line with what the president wants. Yeah. So you know, what, in, your, in other words, which is, you, do you value more, stability in the regulatory review process or presidential priorities? Yeah, well, and to be clear, I mean, I, I, I played a you know, big role in, in sort of developing and implementing the regulatory budget with the in goal yeah. of, you know, sort of rolling back rules. So my, I, you yeah. know, the, don't be confused that I'm just focused on, you know, the, the, the long-term, you know, consistency of programs or something. But, but I, I do think for the foundational documents, there's something to be said for uh, some, some more, uh, a strong, strong dose of stability across, across the decades. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that, if the administration sort of owned these and said, yes, we are, we are intentionally putting normative value judgments into our analysis and, um, uh, and, and thereby uh, exerting you know, presidential control uh, and direction for the administrative state, that that would be, I think that would be appropriate, correct, that, that is what this is. This is, uh, this is an effort to sort of put, um, put uh, sort of policy judgments into the underlying analysis. I mean, Susan, Sally, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure you will. But my 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 view of this uh, ha has been that you know um, the the focus uh, on you know efficiency and the cost benefit analysis framework uh, to date is not it is not intended to replace other policy considerations. It's a supplement to them. So there are all sorts of factors that go into you know decision making on a policy, and so those other types of considerations are you know, on the table in every policy, interagency policy discussion. The economic analysis provides uh, a rigorous, you know, uh, analysis of the, uh, of the efficiency of the, uh, of the of competing uh, alternative solutions um, so that you can make a rational choice. But you sort of lay that alongside of the policy judgment. This puts the policy, all the policy, right into the analysis. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's one. That is one way to sort of flex the, the president's muscles on policymaking, and and they certainly have the uh, you know the the right to do it. It's their their documents they're in charge of now. Now let me flip back to Sally though. This is May on the I? other on the other <laughs> side, which is, you know, a a Anthony's point I think is 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 definitely a strong one here, which is um, 
um, you know, that, that consistency is helpful in how regulation is developed. Now, you only expand on that, which is, you know, I remember in law school reading uh, some of the uh, early um, documents of, uh, from the Roosevelt and Wilson era when uh, federal agencies were first being established, right? And the, a lot of the theory there was that if we only had really smart uh, um, career officials who could simply sit down and look at all of the facts and get politics out of policy making, they would come up with uh, really good, make really good decisions and that would be better for, for, for public, public policy. But as you can hear from what Anthony's saying is that the, even the process by which one gathers the data and kind of gets all the facts, so to speak, it involves some political uh, uh, decisions and hence kind of you know, really calls into question whether or not uh, agencies really can make decisions in a depoliticized environment. Doesn't this just kind of support further the kind of the idea that, again, this supports OIRA that presidential control over OIRA is very important because inherently all public policy decisions are political? I'm going to come at this in three different directions <laughs> <laughs> because I disagree with Anthony on virtually everything he said to the extent I understand it. Um, well, that's good because I think you were earlier worried about uh, a, a lack of disagreement here. Oh, that's so. true. That, that, that's it's not true. a good panel if we don't have some disagreement. Um, let me start by saying I think elections have consequences. And as a result, uh, when a Biden is elected, it's very different from when a Trump is elected. Uh, and it's very different from when a, um, an Obama is elected. And you will expect to see differences in policies and in the implementation of those policies. And I don't think it was any secret that President Biden was concerned about bringing more Americans to the table, whether it was to vote, which is an issue, uh, or to participate in their economic um, lives. So I think that's, that's part of it. Um, going to your uh, addition to the question about the original concept of a um, neutral, mm -hmm. uh, bureaucratic, and I do not say that with a sneer, I actually like bureaucrats. I think they're dedicated, responsible, hardworking, and, and bureaucrat bashing is a disservice to this country, big time. Having said that, the idea was to have people with technical, uh, scientific, economic, even lawyering skills apply neutral principles to a po problem. I think we continue to have that with the civil service. And I think we have that actually also at OIRA where the staff is virtually all um, civil servants. Um, and what they do is produce analysis for the policy decision makers. So what they do is, here are the facts. Do you remember um, Sergeant Friday in Dragnet? The facts, ma'am, just the facts. There's not enough people in the audience here that are old <laughs> enough to remember that. But, but that's what they do. Here are the facts. Here's the analysis. Here's, here are the pros and cons. And then let the policy people figure out what they want to do because going back to the first principles, elections have consequences. But now I want to come to what um, An uh, Tony, uh, Anthony was saying, and that is stability, consistency, yes. Foundational documents, yes. You did not touch 12866. They did, but with a very light hand. I mean, there were three things in there. There was the updating of the definition of economic significance. And as, as Susan was saying, it, you need the administrator's approval now for the fourth category. But that's not the one that calls for the massive cost-benefit analysis. That's the one that calls for a simplified version 
of that in the first instance. Two, the meetings, meetings with outsiders. You know as well as I do, that's a tiny part. It's, it's a big um, time sink for, for uh, staffers at OIRA to have to go to those meetings, and it's of very little value, but that is a small piece of 12866, and it's mostly saying to the agencies, think about ways of getting more involved, and the OIRA staff think about ways of tightening it up. There are, no, there are no demands made in that section. And the third is rethink A4. Now, is A4 a foundational document that has produced stability? To the extent that I can read A4 without falling asleep, I think it's the best answer for insomnia. I mean, it really is. Just pick it up. Keep it on your nightstand. If you ever can't fall asleep, start reading it. Don't it's listen to her. It's fascinating. <laughs> But as I read A4, it's you could do this, or you could do this, or you could do this, or you can do this. There are options put out. There are ways of doing different things, whether it's cost-benefit analysis, cost-efficiency studying, and then all these other names that I can never remember of sophisticated analyses that take place in there. So is it a foundational document? No, it's a, it's a here's various ways of doing of producing the data, and I'm coming back to where I started, of the analysis for the policy people to make a decision. And, we, and it's not foundational, and I happen to think that the two for one, even though you say it's on top of 12866, the two for one really squelched decision making for, um, for new rules. And that was what Trump had campaigned on and as I say, elections have consequences. And I don't, I, I'm not saying you guys destroyed 12866. You never got to it, usually, most of the time. I think Anthony is so, a quick yeah, response I was say, to let that. Me, and let then me have, have Anthony some. respond, and then I'm going to have S Susan talk about some of the implications here. I guess, um, so on the, uh, the executive order itself, I mean, uh, it is no throwaway clause the, um, in section 1. F4, the, la the final clause says, as specifically authorized in a timely manner by the administrative wire in each case. Th this to me is just an affront to the professional staff of OIRA because it says, it says basically that they, cannot, they are not capable of making the judgment about which rules can come in for this review, despite the fact that they are the ones that manage the, they manage the dockets in these areas over the course of generations, this is why this is part of their tremendous value add to the process is that they can they know where all the bodies are buried. They know all the things that I did to this rule, and they can say, "Hey, those crazy people, they were doing all these things. Uh, you need to pull this in and fix those." And that is something that they can um, they know where that is in every rule. And by taking that authority, I mean, what what? How else should I read this clause? It, it's, it, says, it basically says that they cannot make these judgment calls on their own. I, I, I just think that's... On their own. But no one is stopping them from having the thoughtful conversations that I had with all of my staff people before we took matters up the chain. Yeah. No, that's right. That's right. I mean, it doesn't take it doesn't take it away, but it's certainly designed to limit the the um, number of those. It seems to me to be designed to limit the number of those that are reviewed and and um, takes away. I mean, the idea is that the sort of experts should manage it. The people who manage these dockets, um, they're the they're the experts, and they know which of those rules should fall into that category. So that to me is interesting. I mean, also, you know, you mentioned the. Um, that 30 years ago uh, you put the meeting provision in there for a particular reason and that's changed over time. I would say actually that you know, 30 years on the administrative state is much bigger. There's a lot more um, you know, power and authority and decision making and you know, quasi lawmaking within the executive branch. Uh, I think it's a sort of you know, constitutionally you know, sort of dire situation and with that, in, with that general framework I would say we want more participation in all the executive branch processes, more comments, more engagement, and that is part of, as you said, there's the effort to have more affirmative outreach, fine, that's, that's but I think that there should be, we should, you know, part of, part of what we were there, part of the objective was to have 
um, uh, trying to inject more of the sort of you know, APA norms and values into the uh, process as much as we can to try to make this slightly, this whole project slightly more constitutional. Um, and I, 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 uh, if we're, I, I think we should probably not slip into the non-delegation doctrine and some of the other let's, let's come to constitutional law issues, which I am a lawyer too, happy to <laughs> debate. Let me, let me turn to Susan here and so, you started this. <laughs> I think we have a little consensus that the president, at the end of the day, can determine how the oil process works. I think the question there then is: is are the changes going to improve public policy? Right, and that's that's at the core of the question here. So let me ask you, Susan: is where do you see um, if these ref the Biden uh, reforms are uh, adopted? Where do you see the biggest impacts on public policy? Are there particular agencies or policy areas where you think um, the, uh, these changes will have their greatest impact? Yeah, um, let me step back from agencies first. Of the three main reforms that were in the executive order, which yeah. are definition of significant rules for rules that get covered um, by a wire interagency review, second is the public engagement um, both by agencies and by OIRA, and then the third is A4. Um, I, think, I think the definition of significance, it looks like a sleeper, that could be important. So I've, I understand that the CEA, Council of Economic Advisors, has estimated that OIRA will review 20% fewer rules as a result of this. What I don't know and haven't gotten an answer to is whether that's 20% 20, 20 fewer of these economically significant rules because of the 200, 100 to 200 million change, or if it's that other significant category. I think the other significant category may be more, a more important one, and we're just gonna have to wait and see. So I did um, some estimates and thought it could be as many as 60 to 80% of the regulations that OIRA reviews could be not deemed significant. That's probably the higher end, but I think we just have to wait and we'll have to see, does it really significantly change, I shouldn't use significant twice, but does it change the number of significant rules? Um, and that I think is important for various reasons, but I think we've kind of touched on that because we all agree that a wire review um, brings value. Um, on the meetings, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the meetings because I really do agree that they're, they're way too many and they take time away from a very small staff's ability to actually do the review and, um, and the interagency coordination. Um, but in a way, so the one big difference between Sally's time and, and now is that those meetings are posted on the internet. And so that's why, as Sally mentioned, any lawyer worth their salt has to get in and get a meeting. And so you do see, as my experience um, when I was at a, when I was administrator, was that there were too many meetings and too many of them actually didn't help. They weren't valuable and constructive. But I'm not sure, the genie may be out of the bottle. I'm not sure how best to try to rein those in and only hold the meetings, accept the meetings that are gonna be substantive um, as Sally pointed out, and not the ones that just are going to take time. Um, on A4, I'm, I'm concerned about the specifics. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable, though, to, to open it up after 20 years. And one thing that I want to impress upon everyone is that it isn't baked yet. What's in that draft isn't necessarily what will be in the final version that the executive order says should come out by April, um, by next April, within, within the calendar year. So there are problematic parts. You need to bring economic literature, um, legal experience to, to that review process. Um, and just to be clear, and I know since you're mostly lawyers, the executive order itself, not open for comment, it's done. So you can't suggest I mean, changes to that. Um, it is very possible that the next Republican president will rescind it on day one, as have presidents have rescinded previous um, orders, um, pre previous amendments to um, the Clinton order. Um, 
But the two things that are open for comment are both Circular A4, so you have until June 6th to comment on that, and until the end of this week, or maybe even Thursday, to identify peer reviewers, so you can recommend who would be able to peer review that document. So they plan to, um, and I think that's very important. Um, and then the other thing that's open for comment is on how OIRA holds those meetings. So that's also, they have guidelines, a draft guidelines for how they will do that, try to achieve the two goals that Sally talked about. Um, and so that's another thing that, especially if you've had those meetings and have ideas on how to improve it, I'm not sure I do, but I think those are things that, they're not baked yet. Yeah. Sally, so I want to ask you then, where do you see the biggest impacts on policy then? Other, again, particular agencies or, or um, um, policies that t typically would uh, be reviewed by OIRA that won't be? I don't see the latter mm -hmm. very much. I think if there's something that's important, it's going to be seen by OIRA. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is not going to be an issue. In terms of what areas, um, my sense is that this is across the board, mm -hmm. that it is not uh, for environmental only, mm -hmm. or healthcare only, or labor policy only, or even primarily in, in those areas. Um, OIRA has always been quite expansive mm -hmm. in its subject matter and its concerns. And I think this speaks to the process rather than the substance. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, I smashed my uh, 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 crystal ball, crystal ball <laughs> in, in 2016. I figured it's not very valuable. Uh, and so um, I'm, I'm not sure I can right. see ahead to how this will play out, but I suspect that it will be relatively even-handed. And, and you might find areas like, I'm sorry, like, like HUD or education that have not had the kind of microscopes necessarily uh, drawn to them that, that may feel some of this where the, the actual uh, regulatory beneficiaries, if I could call them that, are um, on the ground and want to speak to what's being done for them rather than to them. Andrew, can I jump in sure, since sure. I think I didn't fully answer your question sure. before? Just um, quickly, you asked a specific yep. agencies um, and you mentioned EPA or environmental. I do think um, two things in, in, the cir in the revised circular, which right. isn't final yet, right. would, um, would alter EPA's rules. One is the global benefits, mm -hmm. and that seems to be specifically designed for climate change, climate emissions, the social cost of greenhouse gases, um, and the other is the discount rate. So in terms of the process changes, I think the fourth definition of significance may matter, but that remains to be seen. Um, but in terms of the substantive, I, I think, first of all, a lot, all of Circular A4, and I remembered one more thing I wanted to mention, one change that I thought was important, and that is identifying the need for the regulation in the first place. Um, both President Clinton's order, Executive Order 12866, and Circular A4 talk about a compelling public need, including material failures of private markets. Um, this new A4, or draft A4, still does think about that, but there's less, rely, less um, appreciation, emphasis on, um, on how markets, the, the, what, what competitive markets do for improving um, w you know, well-being and human flourishing, and are much more comfortable with um, identifying other reasons where government can override individuals' decisions and make them better off. 
I, I want to pivot real quick and let Anthony talk just a little bit about the regulatory budget concept. I think he referred to it several times, and uh, he's written a really fantastic article on it um, because I think it is uh, part of the, this discussion about alternatives and how of how to think about <clears throat> how regulation should be overseen. So, Anthony, why don't you walk us through what, 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 what's a regulatory budget? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. <clears throat> um, so, um, Sally mentioned sort of two for one. I guess one of the things that uh, I tried to point out in this uh, mm -hmm. uh, paper is that the regulatory budget that President Trump put in place, um, <clears throat> it attempts to um, look at the uh, overall um, uh, efficiency of, of rules um, by look by focusing um, on the cost side of the ledger um, and integrating into um, a budget the uh, standards of cost benefit analysis so that that is fully contemplated as well but it's a it's a way of um, uh, making uh, policy choices of making regulatory choices um, we uh, uh, our, part of what we did was to um, basically put that uh, onus on the agencies to make those calls so we did not sort of direct you know from from OIRA that you you know you can't do this you can't do that because you have an offset it was more of a ground up exercise um, uh, uh, based on uh, you know what was articulated in the say I Sally was ready to jump out of her chair over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but the idea uh, is to uh, um, is to basically give us another another framework for decision making that integrates with the existing framework. So you said how much total cost the agencies can can devote towards uh, regulations can can um, uh, can impose on the economy yeah. overall and broke it out. That's right. So in the first year it was zero dollars in net new regulatory cost, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then a number in the second year to be determined by the administrator of IRA in collaboration with the agency and various stakeholders within the executive branch and then sort of modified on a rolling basis. And that was really a ground up process. The agencies came in and said, this is what we think our budget ought to be. You know, if you, if you sort of go to any, um, you know, families have budgets, businesses have budgets, religious organizations, everybody has a budget. Um, you know, if a business says, uh, doesn't say to his, you know, uh, CEO doesn't say to the, the sales team, go out and, you know, maximize my profits without uh, without any sort of budget for, for maximizing them, right? He says, uh, which is, I would say here, we, we maximize net benefits, but we need some sort of basic uh, cost budget to get there. Um, and so that was what we tried to do, put, a, put in place a cost framework. Um, I think that, you know, there will, there will very likely be a return of a regulatory budget. It may, I think it'll be interesting to see sort of where this lands, as, as Susan pointed mm -hmm. out, this is a live open uh, discussion and I think it's really important for everyone to sort of engage in that robustly. I think uh, <clears throat> there's a lot here. I, I think when I last checked the Federal Register uh, page, uh, there were something like 400 views total of the uh, <laughs> of the announced change. So still not a lot of eyes on the actual cha changes. And I think it's really important for folks to get in there, read the read the proposed A4, go back and read the original A4. It's great. Um, and actually, a lot of it lives here. So uh, to be, you know, to, to be fair, I've been pretty tough. There is a lot of it. I actually, what I would love to see is a sort of red line. I haven't done, attempted to do that, but I know we we do that on regs all the time. I'd love to see a red line against A4 because there is a lot of. I, I've done it. It's it's pretty messy. Is that, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they, I, I'm sure that uh, it, it could be. Um, it could be provided in a cleaner fashion so that we could see the, the consistency. Yeah, Chris Walker yeah. on Yale Journal of Regulation, their, their blog, has a red line. Yeah. Did they? One. Okay. Yeah. okay, great. Yeah, I, I'm going to go in and take a look at it. Um, but, the, but a lot of it does, a lot of it does sort of carry forward. Um, so. Well, let me pivot to Sally again. Um, so we, clearly, the, the, the Biden reforms um, are going to lead to less regulations going through OIRA. Now let's talk about what are the practical results in the White House for that. Uh, I want to kind of go back to your prior service as Deputy Director of the NEC. Um, does that effectively mean that um, the regulatory reviews are going to move more towards the policy councils? Because if it's not going towards OIRA, uh, somebody in the White House clearly is going to have to make sure that the regulation is consistent with presidential um, um, priorities. And if they're not going through OIRA, does that mean that what we're really going to see in practice is uh, a strengthening role for the policy councils to work either on a, on a probably more informal basis to review and engage with, with the agencies about how rulemaking. So in a sense that all the reforms are doing are 
uh, changing um, the distribution of the review proce process uh, in the White House and moving it away from OIRA? I hope not. Um, but if, what, but if no, that, let me, but uh, how, I'm sorry. How, just, just, but just to follow, but how would that not happen if you're trying to have a White well, House? Well, let's start right. with the assumption. Right. The premise is that there are going to be fewer regulations going through OIRA. I think Susan was very careful mm -hmm. in saying she wasn't sure how that was going mm -hmm. to play out. I'm not sure how that is going to play out, and I don't think anyone else can be sure. And then is the question of those that don't go through, mm -hmm. what are they? Mm -hmm. Are they s fairly simple, straightforward, less controversial? I don't think the White House should be seeing every single solitary clause, sentence, paragraph that comes out of the agencies. We've already moved in the last 50 years or 60 years that I've been in this town, we have moved from having departments and agencies that are expert, as mm -hmm. you were mm -hmm. quick to point mm -hmm. out, being, being made into second-class citizens by a growing White House staff, mm -hmm. growing powers in the councils, growing concentration of things in the West Wing with people who do not have the knowledge, the expertise, or sometimes even, well, I, I'll leave it there before I get in trouble, uh, to make those kinds of decisions and to, to worry that an unknown quantity of efforts by agencies will suddenly be unleashed and that the White House will be embarrassed or terrified by something that is happening at the agencies is, I think, to, to blink reality. Th those people know what they're doing. And they are led by political appointees. And those political appointees are responsible and it takes only one mistake to capture the interest of the White House and to shut down that effort. I mean, we talked earlier about the definition of novelty. No one knew what it meant, and I came up with this scheme of checking with the communications people. And it was about a month and a half or two months after President Clinton had signed the executive order and I was sitting at breakfast and I read about a department that had issued a notice of proposed rulemaking that I thought was, oh my God. And I went into the office and I said, have we seen this? What? No one told me about this. No, we had never gotten it. I called the general counsel of this department and you know what, it never happened again. <laughs> never. In the five years I was there, I was never surprised. All it takes is one instance of some stupidity or slip, however you want to define it or describe it, and that stops. So I think fears of rampant uh, uh, policy decisions coming up all over that nobody can control is probably unfounded. I also think that, and the reason I said no, I don't want it to go to the policy councils, is that OIRA is um, defined by its public meetings, mm -hmm. its um, uh, availability. That is not the case with the NEC and the DPC or, NS or the NSC, NSC, for example. And, and so I don't want to move it across the street. My, I, when I was there, I honestly thought that if nothing ever crosses Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Avenue, I've done my job. <laughs> and that the more that goes over to the policy councils or the West Wing, I've screwed up. 
Well, I, I, will, I will interject to say when I was at the NEC, anytime OIRA could do, do work that we didn't have to, I was very happy. <laughs> There's plenty for the policy councils to do, so yeah. I pretty much agree with that. Yeah, my, <laughs> my concern is a slightly different scenario, yeah. not that novel issues will get out without any yeah. oversight, but that the policy councils will find, who are already working closely with agencies, will bring regulations, will we'll review regulations, but say, don't worry, OIRA, you don't need to see it. Mm -hmm. And so that, and that's the, the scenario that Sally has, is you have these politicals making um, some decisions, and I agree, elections have consequences, but it is much less transparent. One of the real benefits of the OIRA review is it is a transparent process. And I think you lose some of that if that's what happens. If regulations that OIRA is told are not significant are actually managed elsewhere, um, yeah, it, that's the, a concern. The review process will happen someplace, whether it be formal and transparent, right. or it, will it, it be informal someplace. Um, after all, the, the, at some point, the, the president will have, has to weigh in on, on significant regulations, right? So. Um, with that, um, why don't I kind of pivot to um, um, kind of uh, another kind of qu question here is kind of the scope of, of OIRA here. Um, you know, one thing that this didn't do, um, and it's an important thing for, uh, to understand about OIRA, is they, um, oh, okay, questions, Q&A. Actually, let me skip to Q&A, because we only have five minutes left, thank you. Um, right here. If you could just ident uh, identify yourself There's and mics. just keep it, keep there it to- There are mics here. Oh, mics, here. good. Yeah. And if you could just keep it to a question, too. Uh, Roman Bueller with the Madison Coalition. I don't think I've seen four more uh, qualified experts on the regulatory process. And my question is, uh, as you probably know, uh, there is out there a proposal called the Regulation Freedom Amendment to require that major, constitutionally require that major, major new federal regulations be approved by Congress. What do you all think of the principle that at the end of this OIRA process, uh, major new federal regulations ought to be approved by Congress uh, as opposed to simply being dictated by uh, the bureaucracy? Okay. <laughs> as the... Uh, <clears throat> Well, without any descriptive, I think it's stupid. I think it's insane. And I think the other words that come to mind should not be repeated, even if there are no children present. So, so I'm trying to, can you be a little clearer, Sally? <laughs> you want me to hold back? <laughs> I should probably defer to the lawyers over there, but um, I don't think it's quite as stupid as Sally does. I think it, it could, could be a solution to the delegate, the excessive delegation problem. Um, how it would work out in practice, I think it's challenging. Anthony, real quick. I would prefer more sort of front end fixes than back end fixes. Um, but um, there are, uh, you know, the, CR, the Congressional Review Act is one back end fix that's already there. There are other ones that are contemplated, like the Reins Act and Good Act, and I think there's pretty broad sort of view on the sort of philosophical, on the right end of the philosophical spectrum that that should, those are all good and should happen, should move forward. So I expect that, you know, Republicans will push those and that would be fine by me. Next question. Uh, to me, there seems to be uh, two things Can that are you missing. you identify yourself, please? Uh, my name's Devin Watkins from the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, in my mind, there's two things missing from the modern uh, thought around regulations. Uh, first is that it sets up the cost and benefit, but we all know that there's going to be trade-offs that have to be made between certain costs and benefits or risks. But it doesn't, it, it treats it as if it doesn't matter who makes those trade-offs, whether it's a bureaucrat or an individual or Congress. It, it treats it as if liberty and freedom have no value whatsoever. And that to me seems to be a major problem. Uh, the other thing it seems to be missing is uh, error. Uh, anytime you make a measurement of a value and try to say what the facts are, you're never going to be 100% correct or know all the facts, and yet that error really isn't quantified by this process at all. Um, it's done in science all the time to evaluate what your error is and what uh, the likelihood of these being the actual facts are, and yet the 
uh, that, that uncertainty is kind of waved away in, in the modern uh, A4. So I was wondering what the panel's thoughts on those two uh, factors were. This is a great question, Susan. You yeah. want to? Yeah, um, thanks, how do you, Devin. How do you put a, 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 better, a quantify freedom? Yeah, yeah. so I, um, I think that's a very important point, and um, that was one of the comments I made kind of briefly, the, um, the, um, the establishing a need for regulation requires respecting freedom to make, of individuals to make choices. Um, and just starting with a benefit cost analysis that presupposes that we know what's good for people better than they do is a problem. And I think this new, the draft um, A4 takes us further down that path maybe than we already are. Um, the, on the error and uncertainty, it's a huge problem. And, um, and one of the things is we, we do these ex-ante analyses and spend lots of agency resources and estimate benefits and costs down to the dollar. Um, and then we don't go back. First of all, we don't put a range in and say, here are our big assumptions. We're supposed to. Um, but here are the big assumptions that could alter our decision. Um, and we don't go back and see whether we were right. So that is something that um, Sally mentioned, the Obama administration um, orders. They both put a real emphasis on retrospective evaluation. It wasn't done. It hasn't been done. And this, this new orders and seems to re reduce the value of that. I mean, the closest thing might have been um, Anthony's, the um, regulatory budget, budget, because that forced agencies mm -hmm. to look at, gee, do I really need this existing regulation, or is it not working? I could get rid of that one and then do something that's going to be more effective. I would just note that there is discussion of uncertainty analysis in the new A4, and, you, and it's good to read it and comment on it, because it, it gets into it a little bit. And yeah, this is kind of in the weeds, but it, it removes the assumption of risk neutrality, um, and I think that that changes things when it comes Let's to Let's go to our last country. question here, because we're almost can out of time. I, can I just say that the, the 30 seconds. <laughs> three seconds is that the in, attempt to include the marginalized community is an attempt to bring to the table an aspect of freedom and liberty to groups that have had things done to them without their consent, without their input. And I think if one is going to value liberty, one should value liberty for all. My name is Jerry Cox. I've been dealing with federal bureaucrats for the last 35 years. And Professor Katzen, I do not love them. I think if you had spent more time doing what I've been doing and less time in the classroom, the main thing you would have learned would have been talk to the hand. You know, the administrative state, that those folks up there in many of those bureaucratic positions have their own agendas, is not necessarily affected by the election. I think the Trump administration barely made a dent uh, in the administrative state, and it's something that is gonna have to happen. I hope it will happen. Uh, that was just a comment rather than a question, but anybody's certainly welcome to respond to that. Uh, that's just based on practical experience. Well, I had 25 years in private practice before I went into the government, so I have not been in the classroom uh, even half of my career. I have also spent time in several administrations, uh, and so I have worked with uh, bureaucrats in, in different yeah. capacities. I don't think any organization is perfect. None is, including the private sector, where you can sit on the phone and wait for a human being to answer a question or whatever as well. And they all have uh, their own private agendas. I, it, this is not a pissing contest. This is, this is an attempt to try to bring the best that we can. And uh, we may have different views of the value of the civil servants, but I, for one, am more optimistic, apparently, than you are. Let me, let me give, uh, I'm just going to give Anthony, excuse me, I'm just going to give Anthony the last word and then we're, we're running out of time. Thank, thank. I, I would just say that I um, was uh, privileged to work with professional staff across the government and these interagency processes bring together all kinds of economists and scientists and subject matter experts from all different sibling agencies and I was just bowled over by the, uh, the professionalism and skill and 
we d often did not agree on uh, uh, you know the sort of outcomes, but um, uh, but I, I found uh, often uh, to have you know tr you know in a sort of respectful engagement with the staff uh, across the government to have to that things worked very well and it was we were able to have very I, productive I would just engagements. Encourage everybody here to think about the people who are being regulated. Yeah, absolutely. So now I want to thank our panel here and uh, ask to give them a round of applause for just a fabulous discussion.